all starts with the key component of the kidney, this functional primitive, which is called a nephron. Each kidney's got about a million of them, and they look like this. Uh, so you've got your blood supply uh, coming in through the renal artery, and there's something called an afferent uh, arteriole, which forms a little tuft, a little uh, highly uh, branched uh, capillary tuft that creates an immense high surface area at a very focal spot. And all of them do this. Uh, each one of these is, is a nephron. And that little tuft is surrounded by a capsule uh, called Bowman's capsule that is part of the urine collection and excretion system. It ends up being continuous with the urine bladder. It's there to basically uh, receive uh, what gets uh, filtered out. And so the blood comes in here, that's the afferent arteriole, and then it leaves here, that's the efferent arteriole, and it's going to venous at, at that point back into the renal vein. So what's going on in here? Well, there's high pressure arterial blood, and you have a very special membrane uh, here designed just for the capillary tuft. It's a endothelial cell membrane that's like no other membrane in the body. It's designed to allow a lot of things to go out, uh, but keep only a subset of things. And it's designed to keep cells so you don't filter out your cells, you keep those. It actually keeps most of the protein too. It's got a, and we'll show you some graphs on this in a minute, but it retains large proteins and charged proteins. So you don't lose some of these valuable things. But the way the kidney works is basically you start by getting everything else out dump everything else out except for cells and proteins. Then there's a process of selective reabsorption back of what you want to keep of what was filtered. Take back the ions you need, take back the water you need, okay? So dump almost all out and then collect back what you need. And that process, there's this uh, uh, a convoluted tubule, there's a long loop called a loop of Henle. And there's a overarching picture here, which is that as you go deep into the kidney, go deep into the inner zone of the medulla, the extracellular tissue fluid becomes very high osmolarity. It's very concentrated as you go deep. And what that means is this final pathway, this collecting duct, which is going to go into the, uh, the ureters and into the bladder, its final step as it exits the kidney is through an extremely high osmolarity interstitial fluid environment, and it's permeable to water. And so what happens is water leaves, it's drawn up the osmotic, uh, it's drawn down its uh, electrochemical gradient, in this case a chemical gradient of osmolarity, and water is retained due to the high osmolarity of the interstitial fluid, and you end up concentrating urine by that means. The length of the loop of Henle and the depth of the medulla that allows the loop of Henle to be so long is extremely important. Desert animals that generate almost no urine uh, have extremely long loops of Henle and they have very highly concentrated uh, inner regions of the medulla. So that's the uh, uh, big picture and now we're going to zoom in uh, greater detail and think about how these actually work. So here's a single nephron at higher detail. Uh, you can see the afferent arterial, efferent arterial, marulus structure is called, and the Bowman's capsule, which, and you've got the proximal convoluted tubule, which comes right off Bowman's capsule. You've got your loop of Henle. You've got your distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct which goes out to the ureter. Okay, on all this, now we add in all the other nephrons, and you can see all the loops of Henle, different uh, depths, but all extending down into the, into the depth of the medulla. Um, there are several processes that are going on that end up creating urine. There's a filtration, there's a secretion, and the reabsorption. We'll talk about each of those in the sequence. Okay. Filtration, 
what are the quantitative parameters that underlie the efficiency of filtration and what can go wrong with that? Well, first thing to think about is how much volume is coming through. Um, and this relates to total cardiac output, total cardiac output. And right away you can see people who have heart failure are gonna get into kidney failure, right? If you're not generating a high throughput of volume through your kidneys, if you've got congestive heart failure, you've got a weak floppy heart that's not pumping well, or if you're dehydrated, there's not much fluid to go around, well, much less is gonna go through the kidneys. And so there's gonna be less excretion of waste uh, and less balance and homeostatic uh, regulation of everything that needs to be. And the kidneys have an enormous fraction of cardiac output given their size, they get about 25% of the total blood flow. So the renal artery is an extremely a highly trafficked uh, corridor. And think about per day, about 180 liters of plasma actually crosses into Bowman's capsule. The vast majority is absorbed back, only about one to one and a half liters of it. Get down to about one, uh, one and a half. Okay, so how, what, what's exactly going on here in terms of regulating what goes through? Well, some substances, uh, and that's a lot of drugs, uh, more or less uh, passively move directly across. It's a very porous boundary. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, active regulation. In fact, this is the main route by which uh, drugs like penicillin are excreted. And if you have kidney failure, that's something you have to think about. Uh, you'll end up requiring a different dose of penicillin because it's not gonna be. Uh, now, then you've got this active reabsorption and this is very metabolically costly. So you dump everything out, you take back what you need. And even though that there's only 0.5% of body mass that's uh, uh, kidney, uh, about 7% of your whole body oxygen uh, use is uh, involved and that's because of these ion pumps that are constantly moving to absorb back uh, what you need. So here are some useful numbers that help uh, of it all. The first things you notice is how you know, important sodium chloride and bicarbonate are and also glucose. They, in the end, they get essentially completely uh, reabsorbed. You don't lose those at all unless you've got a severe uh, uh, overload or a toxic situation. Yes? That's a good question, actually. Do the nephrons physically, does their structure change? Uh, or maybe even on a microscopic level, microscopic level, the ion pumps and concentrations? Actually, I don't know that. Uh, it's plausible, but uh, I'm not aware of actual kidney plasticity in that sense. Does anybody know about anything like that? I haven't heard of that. I think it's more, it, the system is set up to work with changes so uh, intrinsically to its structure. There's huge change in the water intake that happens to any animal or any person, athlete or not, but I think there's not a, a deep need for that sort of uh, plasticity. Yeah. Kidney will, will lose it if there's too much of it. So th that's fortunate for us, uh, otherwise we run into problems. But what it does is it tells us, uh, you know, historically, uh, you know, salt is, is, it was a rare thing. It's plentiful, of course, in our, our world, but it's, uh, we're set up to retain it because it comes and bursts and you don't know when you're gonna get your next. Okay, um, but of course, you know, there's, it is, although there's not structural plasticity, it, it's constantly changing what it's doing to adapt to your eyes and O's. And urine composition is extremely variable as a result. So, uh, you know, if you do have a big salt load, you will lose some, some sodium. The osmolarity changes greatly, uh, depending on what's uh, pH varies widely, and but only in really serious disease states do you get. Uh, That's a really good question. Uh, it's a, it has a huge behavioral role, as you, as you say, in many mammals. Um, 
and there's some anatomical uh, adaptations to that role. So, you know, there's, there's all kinds of behavioral and anatomical adaptations to allow, you know, urine to be shot higher up on trees and so on to give the larger animals. But uh, in terms of a, a special, you know, marking uh, reservoir or volume, which would be an interesting and useful thing, I'm actually not aware of. Many organisms do have uh, various uh, uh, glands that secrete relevant uh, pheromone or scent markers that are mixed in with the I'm not aware of a, a, a real st structural reservoir that's 